Let's take a look at um, 4.2 part two. So it's the same, um, same section as yesterday, except um, the asymptotes in this section get a little different. Um, we'll still have some that are linear, okay, but they might not be necessarily horizontal or vertical. They might have a certain slope to them. Uh, and then we'll look at one that's like one step up from that, which is a curved asymptote. Um, but that's probably as hard as, as we're gonna look at, okay, like a parabola asymptote. So yesterday, all, everything that we graphed, the degree of the numerator was always less than or equal to the degree of the denominator. It's, that's just, just what we did yesterday. Um, today, this is what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to look at graphing rational functions where the degree of the numerator is now larger than the denominator. Okay, and one thing we're not going to have to worry about too much when this happens is horizontal asymptotes. Okay, when the degree in the top is bigger than the bottom, your horizontal asymptote goes away. And it gets replaced by either what's called a slant asymptote or it could be a curved asymptote. Okay, as far as sketching, slant asymptotes aren't really hard, too hard to sketch. They're, they're pretty straightforward because they're still a line. They're just, they're on a slant. But when we get into like a curved asymptote, that, that's a little, a little trickier to sketch. Okay, so any questions on what we're, we're doing today versus yesterday? All right. So something that we're going to have that is going to be new that we didn't have yesterday. We had end behavior models yesterday. Well, now we're going to have something called an end behavior asymptote. Okay, I would only ask you for an end behavior asymptote in the kinds of problems we're doing today. All right, so again, suppose that we have some function. Okay, we'll call it f of x. And it's a rational function. It's a polynomial divided by another polynomial. Now, when you divide these two polynomials, um, what is the answer called when you divide two things? Yeah, it's the quotient. Okay? And it's possible that when you divide, if it doesn't go in evenly, you have a quotient and you have a remainder. remainder. So when we divide those two, let's suppose we get a quotient and a remainder. Basically, all we have to focus on is the quotient. Okay, that when you divide these two things, the quotient is called the end behavior asymptote. So as far as finding an end behavior asymptote, it's nothing we, we haven't done before. Okay, we've, we've done division with two things, either synthetic or long division. Now we're just calling the quotient something different. We're not calling it the quotient. We're calling it the end behavior asymptote. And hopefully you can see why I would never have asked you about an end behavior asymptote yesterday, because you can't do division with those kinds of problems. Okay, if the degree um, if the degree on the bottom is bigger, then you can't do long division. Okay? It doesn't, doesn't go into it. If the degree on the top is bigger, then you can do long division. And that's where we get this end behavior asymptote. Okay, and you also have the remainder over your divisor. So like, if you wanted to check long division, we've talked about that. Quotient plus remainder over divisor. So any questions on how you find an end behavior asymptote? Okay, just, just the quotient when you divide. So let's find the end behavior asymptote of this, which really finding the EBA and the quotient, it's the same thing. This time they also want the remainder. So we'll, we'll find that as well. Okay, is this, um, is this the kind of problem I could use synthetic division? Yes. Yeah, I could do synthetic division. What number would I put on the outside? Minus two. Oh, no, just two. Just two, yep. And my coefficients on the 
Inside, what would those be? And then we just divide and see what we get. So bring down our 2. 2 times 2 is 4. Negative 4 plus 4 is 0. Times 2 is 0. Add, we get 0. 2 times 0, 0. And we get a remainder of 3. So what is my quotient? Yep. 2x squared. What is my remainder? Yep, Trevor. 3. And what is the end behavior asymptote? 2x squared. It's the same as the quotient. So this would be a problem that if we were to graph it, the asymptote is curved. Okay, it's, it's a parabolic asymptote. Right, and you could type that in on your calculator and you would see that. Um, that's not the only asymptote in this graph. Okay? They didn't ask us to find anything else, but where would you have a vertical asymptote? Yeah, when x equals 2. So this would have a vertical asymptote and a parabolic asymptote. Okay, we're not going to sketch it yet. I just wanted to try to find that stuff. Now, I want you to think about if you write it like this. Quotient plus remainder over divisor. Okay, I'm going to write that out. Quotient plus remainder over my divisor. X minus 2. So now if you think about it this way, I want to answer this question. What happens to the remainder as x approaches infinity? Okay, so the thing that I just circled, what happens to that as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger? It gets smaller, and what does this approach? Zero. Okay? That's why the remainder doesn't really matter as x gets bigger and bigger. Okay, like if x is 1,000, 1,000 minus 2 is 998. And 3 divided by 998, that's extremely small. Okay, so it's a number that really doesn't matter. That's why we're not really focusing on the remainder when we talk about end behavior asymptotes. Because it just gets so small, it doesn't make a difference. Okay. So what happens to the remainder as x approaches infinity? The remainder approaches 0. Does it ever does it ever reach zero? No. no. Because you're always taking three and dividing by something. So I don't care how big of a number you divide by, three divided by a billion is still it's not zero. Okay, so the remainder approaches zero. Okay, any questions on that? Alright. So um, Three kind of important points to keep in mind. Um, there's a difference between an end behavior model and an end behavior asymptote. First of all, end behavior asymptotes don't exist for the kind of problems we did yesterday. And second, the procedure for finding an EBA versus an EBM is different. An EBM is, I think, is easier. Just the highest degree term in the top divided by the highest degree term in the bottom. The EBA, you have to do long division or synthetic division. Okay, if they asked us to find an end behavior model for the kind of problems we're doing today, um, we could. Okay, generally, it's, it's not as important as it was yesterday. But we could find it on the kind of problems we're doing today. We could do the EBM and the EBA. And sometimes they would come out the same, sometimes they would come out different. It depends on the kind of problem we're doing. You'd never be asked again to compare an EBM and an EBA for the kind of problem we did yesterday. Because EBA doesn't exist yesterday. It only exists for the kind we're going to do today.
And this is summarizing something I've already said a couple times. Anytime the degree of the numerator is less than or equal to the degree of the denominator, okay, so in other words, the kind of problems we did yesterday, your asymptotes are always straight lines, all of them. Okay. You might have a, a vertical line or a couple of them somewhere. Um, horizontal asymptote at zero is, is usually pretty common. And you can also have a horizontal asymptote at a number that's not zero. Okay, so as long as the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, or equal, you get straight line asymptotes. If not, asymptotes can be curved. Okay, and you can see how bad the curve is basically going to be by comparing the degree in the top to the degree in the bottom. The further apart they are, the worse the asymptote is going to be. So if I go back to this one for a second. In f of x, what was the degree in the top? Uh, just the degree. Cube, 3. Yeah, so degree 3. What's the degree in the bottom? 1. How far apart are 3 and 1? Two, okay. So that tells me because they're two degrees apart, the asymptote is going to be a degree two. If the top was a degree four and the bottom is a degree one, now they're three apart. That would be a cubic asymptote. So in general, we don't like the degree in the top to be too far away from the one in the bottom because that's going to make the asymptote worse or, or harder to sketch. All right, so what I'm going to do using the, uh, the calculator is I'm going to take the asymptote that we just found, I'm going to graph it, and I'm going to graph the original problem and show you that it really is the end behavior asymptote. All right, so let's, um, let's take the original. 2x cubed minus 4x squared plus 3. And make sure you put that in parentheses because we saw when we did that homework problem, if, if we don't, sometimes things don't work out. It's 4x squared plus 3. And we're going to divide by x minus 2. I'll start with a standard window, but I'm probably going to have to adjust it. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to adjust it because I know that I should have an asymptote that's parabolic, and it's like I'm seeing half of a parabola, but not the other half. So just try setting your y max. Let's try putting it at 25 and. See if we can see a little more. All right, so there's, there it is coming back in at the top. If you want to see more of it, you can go even higher. Um, I don't think we really need to see too much more of it. All right, so there's our graph. Okay, definitely, we've got a vertical asymptote at 2. And let me graph the EBA. Let me graph 2x squared and show you what that looks like. Okay, so it's going to be um, it's going to be a little hard to see. But let me um, put it over here. Okay, and let me make it bigger. So what's happening is that red is my, um, is my asymptote. That blue is the original. You should be able to kind of see that the blue and the red curve are getting closer and closer and closer together, but they will never touch. Okay? That red line is the asymptote. So that blue curve is just going to try to get closer and closer to it. Okay? And it almost looks like they overlap, but again, remember they're they're asymptotes, so they don't, they don't actually touch. It just gets closer and closer. 
Okay, so any questions on that? So 2x squared is the end behavior asymptote for the function in blue. Okay. So when we're sketching it, basically what we're going to do is we'll sketch a parabola. Okay, we can start with that, but then we have to kind of erase the section that's near the vertical asymptote. All right, because it's not really going to connect. All right, but that's how we can start. Draw our connected parabola, and then I'm going to erase the section near the asymptote. And I'll investigate the behavior on each side. Okay, just like I did before. I'll try like 2.01 and 1.99. And usually one side is going to be up very high. The other side is down very low. All right, but that's, that's as bad as the um, graphs get that, that we're going to sketch. All right, so example six, uh, that's what I basically just did on the, on the graphing calculator. All right, and now let's actually sketch the, um, the problem we've been working with. Okay, we'll do it, do it by hand. All right, so I know my end behavior asymptote is that 2x squared. So basically what that means is as I get farther and farther away from the origin, my graph is going to look just like a parabola. So let's, let's sketch that parabola. And then we're going to erase the section that's near the um, vertical asymptote. All right, so let's just pick some values. Um, let's say we could do zero. Let's plug that in. Um, Plug in negative one, negative two, three. Uh, I don't think I can go too much higher because I'm going to be off the graph. All right. So at zero, okay, if I plug zero in for x, what's my y value? Zero. Okay. And don't get too picky because remember, I'm going to try to erase the part that's near the origin. I'm just doing this to kind of get my initial sketch. Um, what's negative 1 squared? Yeah. Times 2? Two. Two. 2. How about negative 2 squared? Four. Times 2? Eight. 8. All right, so I can kind of get an idea of, of the left side. And remember, 2, we have an asymptote, so we'll check that out in a second. How about um, if I plug in 3? What's 3 squared? Nine. Times 2? All right, so... Kind of on the edge of my graph there. All right, so let's put our let's put the vertical asymptote in. Okay, where does the vertical asymptote happen? At what number? Two. Two. So I'm going to put that. So I know I'm never going to cross that. Okay, so we're going to have that parabola shape, but it's going to do something weird near um, near the as vertical asymptote. All right, so I think I've already got it typed in so I can use my table. What's the number just to the left of 2? So, yeah, like 1.99. Okay, and I can see that if I type that in um, on y1, that's what I'm looking at, I'm at negative 300. So I'm going to be way down here. What's a value that's just after 2? Sure, 2.01. And I'm up at positive 300. All right, so I'm like way up here. All right, so I think I've got enough information to sketch sketch the left side. Okay, so kind of it's going to come down like a parabola, and it's going to curve, and then it's just going to come down and get closer and closer to that asymptote. Okay, so there's my parabola shape on the left. Um, on the right, I kind of want a little bit more um, detail. All right, so I'm going to type in a few more values. Okay, at 2.5, I'm at 18.5. Maybe about right there. Um, let's try 3 I already did. Let's try 3.5. Um, that's going to be off the graph. So I think that's probably a, 
about as much detail as I can really get, unless I had my grid go um, higher. So it's going to come down. It's going to hit a minimum right in there somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where, but it's going to be right about there. And then it's going to go back up very quickly. Okay, so this, there's my, my asymptote. So if that blue line represents 2x squared, the black line should keep getting closer and closer to it. Right, and that's basically what, what we had when we graphed it. Okay, in this section, I don't think I sketched it quite perfect, but I'm not going to be too picky about that. It almost looks like there's actually a local minimum, and then it comes up and then back down. Um, again, if you really wanted to figure that out, you could try a few more points. You know, try positive 1, 1.5, you get a little more detail in that section. But as long as you have the overall picture like that, that's, that's fine. So, any questions on sketching that? Yeah, those, are, those are the harder ones to sketch, but we're not going to do any harder than a parabola, parabolic asymptote. All right, how about this one? Is this going to have a um, parabola asymptote? No, why not? How do you know? This one's not going to be as bad as a parabola. Yep. Yeah, the highest degree, the degree in the top and the bottom are only one away. So we're going to get something that's a degree one, right? Um, when you graph something that's just an x, not an x squared, what shape is that? Yeah? Yeah, it's just a line. We don't necessarily know is it horizontal, vertical, or is it a line that's on a slant with a certain slope? Uh, but we'll find that out right now. Okay, how do I get the end behavior asymptote? What do I have to do here? Yep, I got to divide. And can I use synthetic division? What do you think? Molly, can I use synthetic division here? Not sure. Anyone help her out? Can I can I use it? And then uh, whatever you say, tell me when I can use it. If if you think I can't here, yeah. You can't use it because there's more than just x minus or plus something in the denominator. Exactly. If you're going to use synthetic division, the denominator has to be x plus or x minus a number. It can't be x squared and all this other stuff. Okay. So this one we have to do long division um, to get our asymptote. So we got x squared plus 2x minus 3 divided into 2x cubed plus 7x squared minus 4. Now, once I get the quotient, I can stop. I don't really care about the remainder because we saw that the remainder approaches 0. We're not, we're not interested in that. Um, so, Quinn, if I divide x squared into 2x cubed, what do I get? Uh, yep, 2x. Multiply it back out. Um, I should also fill in my zero term here. Sorry. All right, so multiply it back out. I get 2x cubed plus 4x squared minus 6x. And we're subtracting all of that. Okay, I'll move my graph after. Yep, so that's gone. Um, so 3x squared and then 0 neg or yeah, 0 minus minus 6 becomes a plus 6. And bring down my next term. Alright, uh, what do I get if I divide x squared into 3x squared? Yeah, just positive 3. Now, technically I can stop. I have my quotient. That's my quotient. 
I only have to keep going if I want the remainder. Okay, but I'm not, not interested in the remainder here. So since that's my quotient, what else does that mean this is? Yes, it's my end behavior asymptote. 2x, y equals 2x plus 3. Okay, so let's sketch that. So that's going to be a line with a y-intercept at what number? 3. And a slope of 2. So up 2, right 1. All right, so let's put in that as a dotted line. So that's one asymptote. Um, so it says we got the EBA, now they want vertical asymptotes. Okay, vertical asymptotes are where the what is equal to zero? The bottom. Okay, is the bottom something I can factor? Yeah, I think we can factor the bottom. So let's, um, let's just write it right below it. My signs would be what? Plus and minus. Plus and minus. And two numbers that multiply to give me three are three and one. And let's try plus three, minus one. Okay, does that work? Okay. Yeah. So, because this is a cubic in the top, um, we could always confirm it by graphing, but that's going to be hard to try to factor by hand. Okay, so. I'm going to say that these are, these are vertical asymptotes. And again, if I'm not sure, I'll double check that um, by graphing right now. All right, so let's, just to make sure we don't have a hole. 2x cubed plus 7x squared minus 4. Divided by, and I'll fix that in a second, x squared plus 2x minus 3. There's an asymptote, there's an asymptote. Yep, so we don't have a hole. Just, I can tell just by looking. So let's put in, um, put in our two vertical asymptotes. Okay, they're going to be at x equals negative 3 and x equals 1. Right, so negative 3, 1. And again, we've divided the grid into six sections. Um, but we're only going to use three when we, when we do our sketch. Okay, my next step is let's check behavior on each side of the asymptotes. Okay, what's a value just a little smaller than negative three? 3.01. We're up at infinity. Okay, how about a value just to the right of negative three? 2.99. Okay, we're at negative infinity. Way down there. All right, um, let's check just before the number 1. 0.99. So we're at negative infinity again. And just after the number 1. Or positive infinity. All right. Now, what you could do is, if you want to get an idea of what's kind of going to happen, is let's try like let's try negative four, okay? Just to get an idea of the curve. Negative four, negative four is a point on the graph. So, negative four, negative four, just about right there. And I think that's all I need to do the left section. Okay. So I got to be getting closer and closer to that line. And all of a sudden, it has to turn and get closer and closer to that line. Um, I could do kind of the same idea for the for the right section. Okay, let's. Um, okay, we tried just after one. Let's try two. Okay, and see see where we are. So two eight is a point on the graph. Two. 
eight. And I think that's enough, because now I can tell I have to be getting closer and closer here, closer and closer here. And I've got to connect those two sections with a curve somehow. So just kind of have it come down, connect, and go back up. Okay, the only thing I don't know is what's happening in the middle. Okay, I know I have a point way down at negative infinity on both. Um, what's another good value I could try? Sure, I could do negative 1, and I get negative 0.25. Okay, you could even you could do 0. 0, uh, 1.3. So now you've got to connect all those dots in the middle. And it has to be getting closer and closer to each, each asymptote. So this one will be something like this. It's not, it's not perfect, but that's, that's the basic graph there. Right, so we get that curve in that left section here and then the right section. The reason you're seeing more of the um, right section is because I'm zoomed way out. This is the standard window, and now this should look exactly like what we have. You're just seeing a small, small piece of that top section. Okay, so any questions on that one? It's again, just use your table to help you get some points, um, as many as you need, but definitely check just to the left and just to the right of the asymptote every time. So that asymptote that we just drew, that was a slant asymptote. Okay, slant asymptotes take the place of a horizontal. You'd never have a horizontal and a slant at the same time. So I think a slant is a little bit harder than a horizontal, but it's definitely not as bad as trying to sketch uh, a curved asymptote. So. As far as a test question, I would focus more on the, the slant asymptotes. That's probably the kind of question you would see on a test. Okay, so what I would do also on the test is I would ask you for the equation of the slant asymptote, which your calculator can't give you. You can see, you can see the picture, but there's no way to figure out that that's a line with a slope of 2 and a y-intercept of 1, okay, without doing the long, uh, y-intercept of 3, sorry. You've got to do the long division. Okay, any question on example 7? All right. Um, does anybody feel like they, they need to do another another one? This is just like the last one we did. How do I know that this is not a parabola asymptote? And then once I know that, I want you to tell me what kind of asymptote it, it will be. Yeah, Zach? Um, it's going to be a slant because the degree of the numerator is one more than the denominator. Yeah. The degree in the numerator and denominator are only one apart. So when you divide them, you're going to end up with a degree 1, which is a slant asymptote. Yep. Okay, so any questions on how you'd go through and do that? Um, only thing that's a little different here is, in the last problem, we had two vertical asymptotes. How many am I going to have in this one? Just one. So this one's actually a little easier. Just going to have one vertical asymptote. Check the behavior on each side, and check a couple extra points to figure out the curve. Um, it's not that bad, and that would be a good test type question, too. It's a little bit easier than the last one, so it'll be a little quicker. All right, so let's try that one, and then we'll do that word problem, and that'll be it. Okay, this I just want to graph by hand, because I want to show you something that when you graph, you need to be careful with. So it's two x to the fourth plus seven x cubed plus seven x squared plus two x 
And we're going to divide by x cubed minus x plus 50. Okay, and I'll start out with the standard window, just like always, and then I'll look at what happens from there. Zoom out a little bit and get a little bigger picture. So what kind of asymptote did we get there that you should expect to get just by looking at the degree in the numerator and comparing it to the denominator? There is a slant asymptote. And if you did the long division, you could, you could find what it is. This one's a little weird because it kind of has that shape on the left we've seen before, but on the right, it kind of comes down, it curves, and then all of a sudden it starts to bend a little bit. Uh, but any thoughts about, especially if I go like this, something that I might want to look at a little closer? Something that I think if you look at it on that window, it's a little deceiving. Like, let's say I asked you for all local mins and maxes here. What might you have to do? I definitely can see there's a local max right here. But what might you want to check out a little closer? OK, how would I? I don't see any minimums there. That, that part just looks flat to me. So what are you, what are you thinking? How would I figure that out? All right, I could press trace and I could try to just, you know, trace along it and see, you know, see what's happening. But it's kind of, kind of hard to see on that window. So what could I do with my window? Yeah, why don't we zoom in and see if that section really is as flat as it looks? So let's try zooming the y in between 1 and negative 1. <coughs> All right, so let's try negative 1 to positive 1. So now I'm really zooming in on that section that looked flat. All right, can I tell much? No. Nope. So what might I want to try now? Yeah, let's, let's even try like... 0.1 to negative 0.1. So let's zoom in 10 times more. So let's try negative 0.1 to positive 0.1 on the y-axis. So now we're really zooming into that section that looked flat. And what do you notice about that section that looked flat? It's not flat. It's not flat. Right? So this would be a pretty tricky problem if I asked you for all local mins and maxes. There's a ton in that section that looked flat. Okay? It actually, there's um, two minimums and a maximum in that section that you thought was flat. Okay, so my point with this, um, with this problem is just make sure that if you have a window that's zoomed out kind of far and things look, you know, might look really flat, you should always zoom in, check it out, and see what it what it really looks like. All right, so that is that. Okay, any questions on that? Now, obviously, if you were sketching this, you can't really sketch all these twists and turns. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be looking for all the detail in the sketches. What I would be looking for is, can you find all the local mins and maxes if I asked you for that? Okay, so this problem has two local mins and two local maxes. This was the only local max you could see easily. But there is another one hidden in that flat section. Okay. Uh, another question I could ask you is how many times does the graph cross the x-axis? Okay. And in this case, it crosses one, two, three, four times. Very, very hard to see if you don't zoom in. And not something you could really do algebraically. It'd be kind of difficult. 
Okay. So any questions on that one? Okay, and our last one. Okay, so it's going to be a um, rectangle problem. We've looked at these kinds of problems before. And they're telling us the area of the rectangle is 200 square feet. And to represent that width as x. So they want us to find an algebraic representation and a graph of all the perimeters as a function of x. So in other words, we're going to look at all the different perimeters for a rectangle that has an area of 200. And within that, I want to find the dimensions of the rectangle with the smallest perimeter. Okay, so I'm looking for the rectangle with an area of 200, and I want to find the smallest perimeter I can. Okay, in calculus, this would be um, it's an optimization problem, okay, which you can solve with straight cal calculus and algebra. And I'm throwing pens on the floor. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to do, though, is we're not going to do um, we're not going to do calculus or, or algebra because we don't know calculus yet. So we'll we'll try to do a um, graphing approach. All right. So first of all, I got to somehow set up an equation. Okay, my perimeter as a function of x. Okay, what's the perimeter for a rectangle? Two L plus two W. All right. Now I've got to be a little more specific than that because I know some things about right rectangle. Okay. What do I know about my rectangle? X is the width. Yep. So we're going to use an X in here somewhere. And what else do I know? Yep. The area is 200. So now you've got to make the length something so that when you multiply it by the width, you get 200. So what would you have to make the length so that length times width is 200? Because that's the formula for area. So 200 equals what times x? Right, that's going to be my length, 200 divided by x, because now when you multiply length times width, you get an area of 200. Now I know my length, I know my width, now I can fill into my perimeter formula. Okay, my length is 200 divided by x. Um, I need to double my length. So what's 200 divided by x doubled? Um, 400 divided by 2x would actually be the same thing as 200 divided by x. If you multiply both the top and the bottom by 2. In this case, just multiply the top by 2. And think of the bottom as multiplying it by 1. Okay, so it's 400 over x plus, what's, what's uh, my width? 2x. Yep, so x and then double it. There's a formula for all the perimeters you could have for rectangles that have an area of 200. Now, you could find a common denominator if, if you, they asked you to. Um, they, they didn't ask us to. So in this case, I'll just leave that. Find a complete graph, and then find the dimensions of the rectangle with the smallest perimeter. Um, well, if I did have a common denominator, what would be easier to tell that I, I can't tell like this? What's the end behavior asymptote here? What's the degree in the top? Trevor? Uh, one. Uh, I don't know, maybe. I, say, I, think you can tell. I can't tell this way, right? I don't have a fraction with everything together. I've got two fractions that are separate. 
So if I did want to know what kind of asymptote I'm going to get, I would have to put a common denominator of x. Okay, just like we did, I, th I think this was in a homework problem. Okay, this already has a denominator of x. What's the other fraction missing? It's missing an x in the bottom. So I could multiply top and bottom by x. Now I can definitely tell you what kind of asymptote it's going to be. They're one degree apart. So what kind of asymptote is that? That's a slant. Okay, so this is going to have a, um, a slant asymptote. So that might just be helpful when I'm graphing it. It kind of tells me what I'm looking for. All right, so let's graph it. It doesn't matter which one you type in there. Same thing. Um, I'll just type the first one in. 400 divided by x plus 2x. Where is my vertical asymptote? Yep, it's going to be at 0, which should make sense because you can't have a width of 0. All right, so let's start with the standard window, and that didn't really tell us much. So in, a, in order to find out maybe what I need to set my window at, what do you think I should go to on the calculator? Okay. Yeah, why don't we go to the table and just see, well, if x is 1, what's the perimeter? Okay, it's at 402. So that's a little off my standard window. X is 2, 3, 5. At some point, it's going to start heading back up. Trust me. Okay. So there's a minimum in here somewhere. That's what I need to find. So I'm going to graph it. Let's set our y max up at 400. And let's set our x max at 30. I'm just, just guessing. What did I say for y max? 400. Uh, there's no such thing as negative width or negative perimeter, so you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so there's all the different perimeters. So you can see if you make your width very, very, very small, like if you make a really long and skinny rectangle that's 200 units in area, your perimeter is huge. But somewhere, somewhere in here, there is a minimum. Now, it's not as sharp of a minimum as we're used to seeing, but I can tell it's definitely going down, and now it's going back up. Right? So let's um, find the minimum. Okay, how do I do that? Yep. Second calc minimum. Okay, so pick a point where you definitely know you're to the left of your minimum. Okay, I'm at 57, so once I see that going back up, all right, now I know I'm to the right of my minimum. And let's just take your guess. And it says the minimum is at 14.14. Okay, that's the value for x. So find the dimensions of the rectangle with the smallest perimeter. Okay, so our width was x. So what did it just say x is? 14.14. How can I get the length? Yeah, my length is 200 divided by 14.14. I get 14.14 for the length. So what does that mean? It's a square. It's always a square. Okay. If you want to make a shape that has a minimum perimeter, and has a certain amount of area, um, the best way to do is to make it a square. And where you'd use that is like if you were trying to fence something in and it had to be a certain area, but you wanted to use the least amount of fencing possible. Okay. Hey, any questions on, on that? So the homework tonight, uh, same, same section as last night, so just continuing on, it's page 235. 
Okay, so 38 to 43, 45 to 47, and 51, 52, 55, 62, 63. Okay, so we'll look at that tomorrow, and then tomorrow we'll finish up everything we're doing for this week. Um, last section will be 4.3. And I'll also be after school tomorrow in case anybody needs to take a test or stop by for extra help.